firstborn son with the angel of death soon passing through it was hard to fall asleep and one little lamb stuck in his mind as he lay there counting sheep wondered why the little lamb had to die and why his blood was on the door through the wind and the rain it had still remained he wanted to be sure so he called out to his father with a trembling voice so scared, crying, Father, please, will you look and see if the blood is still there? He said, Son, now don't you worry, for the blood is there to stay. The wind may blow and the rain may fall, but it just won't wash away. The blood will stand the raging storm. It's been applied with love and care. Safe, secure, you can rest assured that the blood is still there. Looking over all the damage the storm had left behind, a flood of endless questions and doubt had filled my mind. And the fear that gripped my troubled soul Brought me to my knees in prayer Crying, Father, please will you look and see If the blood is still there And he said, Son, now don't you worry for the blood is there to stay. The wind may blow and the rain may fall, but it just won't wash away. The blood will stand the raging storm. It's been applied with love and care. Safe, secure, you can rest assured that the blood is still there. Safe, secure, you can rest assured that the blood is still there. That's a good song. Amen. That's great. Thank you, Joe. Beck, I appreciate it. Let's open our Bibles to Romans chapter 5. Romans 5. It, is it loud on the platform to you guys? A little bit. It's a little overwhelming down here. How is it out there to you guys out there? Is it is good? All right. It's a little loud up here, Brother Greg, this morning, but that's okay. I enjoyed that song. I enjoy the emotion. Amen. I do. I think it's good. I, it's a, you know, We cry over the silliest thing. People cry over losing a football game. Brother Marty, Ohio State, they got whacked. He just cries and cries. 
Yeah, he's shouting today. He was crying two or three weeks ago. Yeah, so uh, we cry over basketball. You know, we cry over the most foolish things. It's okay to get worked up about spiritual things and let the tears flow. Thank you, Beck. I enjoyed that. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to read two verses, jump into the message this morning. Romans 5. Look at the very end of the chapter, verse 20. We're going to pick it up. And I, I would like to read verses 17. I'd like to actually begin reading verse number 12, but for sake of time, I'm just going to read 20 and 21. We'll refer to the passage. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. I'd like to speak to you on this subject. In the junk, there's a jewel. In the junk, there's a jewel. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We thank you that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. And when it's applied, it's permanent. Thank you for that. Thank you for the good song. Now, would you please speak to our hearts, dear Spirit of God. I ask and pray in Jesus' name, and amen. Be seated, please, if you will. Let me ask you to do your best to remain seated. We had a lot of folks had to leave during uh, announcement time. I'd like to keep the distractions to a minimum uh, for the next 30, 35 minutes in this message. Speaking of Brother Marty, several years ago, we were preparing for our first or second yard mart. I don't remember exactly all the details of this perfectly, but I'm giving you the, the, pretty much the gist of what happened. Marty was working at Grant Park, and you had a co-worker whose mother died, and they were going to empty out the, 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 the house. Am I right so far? You think so? You're, <laughs> hey, look, man, you're not as old as I am. We're, we're in trouble, okay? But he's emptying out the house, and, you know, Marty, somehow Marty finds out that this guy's got this, his mother passed away. They got a, a house full of her stuff. And Marty says, man, our church is having a great big indoor yard sale. And the guy says, well, look, take everything. And so that somebody went, you went, people went, loaded up boxes, 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 brought it in. And I don't remember who was going through it. Most of it, it was probably 50-50. Some of it we couldn't use. Some of it we could use. And somebody was digging through a box. Now, you know what, you know what yard sales, right? One man's trash is another man's treasure, right? So they're digging through this box and, you know, throwing out the stuff that's, that's of no use to us. And then in the middle of this box of stuff that was no use, they ran across a couple of little jewelry boxes. And I think it was Pam or somebody, some of you ladies might have been doing that. But they said, man, this, uh, Dorothy, you might have been involved in that. Mary Miracle, I think, was. And somebody said, you know, this is not cosmetic jewelry. And some of it was. And so they took it to a jeweler in town. And most of it was cosmetic, but there, I think there were three pieces that were, that were really nice. And we sold those. I think we got something like five, $600 total for those three pieces of jewelry, those three rings. In the midst of all that junk, there were some jewels in a box of mostly trash. There was a treasure. Now, with that story in mind, Romans chapter 5, verse number 12, introduces us to one man. That one man's not named in this verse. He is named later on. Look at verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man. That one man is Adam. Okay? So, Romans 5, 12 introduces us to one man by the name of Adam. In verse 15, we are introduced to another man. See it toward the end of the verse. And the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ. So 5.12 introduces us to one man named Adam. 5.15 introduces us to another one man named Jesus Christ. And in these, in these verses, in this passage, Paul contrasts, now listen carefully, what we as human beings lost in Adam when he sinned, and what we as believers have gained in Jesus Christ. In verse number 19, the Bible tells us because of Adam's disobedience, we are sinners. Look at it, verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience, that one man is Adam, okay? Because of Adam's disobedience, we are sinners. Now look what the rest of the verse says, verse 19. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. That's talking about Jesus Christ. So by Adam's disobedience, we lost everything. By Christ's obedience, we have potential to gain everything back. 
You say, what kind of obedience are you talking about, about Jesus? Well, let me tell you, Philippians 2 verse 8 says, And being found in fashion as a man, he, Jesus, humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross. So because Jesus Christ came to earth, went to the cross, died, was buried, and rose again, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, because He did that, we can be saved. Because Christ came and went to the cross, died, was buried, and rose again, we can have that, we can regain everything plus what we lost in Adam. We're all sinners by birth because of Adam's disobedience. Now, you might sit here tonight, this morning and think to yourself, boy... When I get to heaven, I'm going to give Adam a piece of my mind. I get my hands on Adam up at... Remember, folks, there's no killing in heaven, okay? Yeah, I'd give him a piece of... Causing all of this trouble because he couldn't keep his hands off of a piece of fruit. Couldn't keep his hands off an apple. How do you know it was an apple? Could have been a fig. That's kind of... Could have been an apple. Could have been a pear. Poor apple. Huh? How you wait till I get to heaven? I see Adam. I'm going to give you know, all because he couldn't keep his hands off of one piece of fruit. Now, folks, look, we're in bad shape because of Adam's disobedience. But lest we blame Adam, look at verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. So lest we just blame Adam acting like, watch it, we're the victims of his disobedience. That's sorry, Adam. Man, you wait till I get to heaven. I see, I'll give him a piece of my mind. He caused all the human race, all this trouble. Like we're the victims of Adam's disobedience. You know, so in, case that, in case anybody would think that way, the Bible says that God gave the law. And you know what the law does, folks? The law exposes all of us for what we are. It has nothing to do with Adam. The law shows us how wicked and how sinful and how vile we are. The Ten Commandments, those ten thou shalt nots in Exodus chapter 20, and we find ourselves breaking most of those commandments. We find ourselves guilty of covetousness, guilty of lying, guilty of hating, guilty of lusting. You know why, folks? Sin abounds in human life. Sin abounds in my human life. Sin abounds in your human life. And let's think about this for just a minute this morning. Sin abounds. Listen, what, what sin abounds in is not good. When you think of the word abound, usually we put something positive with it, right? If you're abounding in blessings, you're, you're overflowing with blessings, good things, happy things, wonderful things. But where sin abounds, it's not good. And according to verse 21, ultimately sin abounds in death. With sin, the arrow is never pointing up. It's always pointing down. With sin, nothing is ever trending up. Sin is trending down. And the Bible, you know, ultimately sin abounds in death. And the Bible talks about the death of everything. The death of joy. The death of peace. The death of morality. The death of decency. The death of rest. Soul rest. Sin abounds in death. Listen, sin never progresses. Sin always regresses. I can't think of a life or a person in the Bible whose life more clearly illustrates this than Samson. We won't turn there and read about Samson this morning. Hopefully you know a little bit about him. He was one of the judges of Israel. And the Spirit of God would come on Samson. Samson and he was able to perform these unbelievable, uh, uh, unreal, mighty acts of supernatural strength. When the Spirit of God came on him, God used him in unbelievable ways. But he toyed around with sin. He had a casual attitude about sin. And he laid his head in Delilah's lap. And he toyed and he played 
with sin until finally he crossed the line. And when he woke up to go out and try to defend himself, as he had at times before, he didn't realize that his strength was departed from him. And he was like any other human. Powerless. Strengthless. And the Philistines took him and captured him. And the Bible says that they put out his eyes. Sin blinds. People cannot see the truth, the reality about sin because it's camouflaged many times. It's disguised. Sin blinds. After they put out his eyes, they bound him with fetters and chains. Not only does sin blind, sin binds. You see that in the life of the drunk. You see that in the life of the drug abuser. You see that in the life of the habitual liar. You see that in the life of the slothful man. Sin binds. If you don't kick sin, folks, off the throne of your heart, it will rule and reign. That's what sin does. It binds. Not only did they put out his eyes, blinded him. Not only did they bind him with fetters, they took him down to the threshing floor where they usually hooked up the oxen to turn the great big wheel that ground out the grain. And they took the ox out and they put Samson in the place of the ox and they made him grind grain. You know what sin does? Sin blinds, sin binds, and sin grinds. The devil is a consumer. He will take a life and use it and abuse it and squash it and grind it until there's nothing left, then throw it off to the side. That's what he does. When sin abounds, it's not pretty. When sin abounds, it's ugly. You see this man whom God used grinding like a, a, a cow. He's blind, and they take him and put him in the, in the, in the, in the temple of the Philistine gods, 3,000 of them, and they're laughing at him and mocking him. See him as he pulls the two pillars together, and the whole temple complex you know, it just, it just falls flat, and he dies with the Philistines. That sin abounding, a man that God had used dying in suicide with the Philistines. Because sin blinds, sin binds, and sin grinds. Oh, the awfulness of sin. Listen, you, listen, as careful as you can try to be, if you have attempted to listen to the news or read the news in the last four weeks, it has been impossible, as careful as you can be, to avoid hearing about the debauchery. The debauchery that's in Hollywood. And in Washington, D.C. Mark it down, neighbor. In most positions of power and prestige, there is wicked, vile sin. If you have any, any brain about you whatsoever, you have, you have seen some of these articles in immorality and lust and licentiousness. And it doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or a Republican or an Independent, if you're man or woman, if you're black or white, if you're conservative or liberal. Sin knows no partiality. It's vile. It's wicked. It's filth. Oh, on the outside, externally, you know, there seems to be prosperity and money and power and position and prestige and possessions. The who's who of politics and the who's who of entertainment. We're learning about their private lives and it's full of filth. Full of filth. So much so that you can't read it. If you're smart, you just see the headline and move on. Sin is exceedingly sinful. Here's a new story. The man kills his wife and his three kids. A mother kills herself and her children. Gang members kill a rival, cut the heart out of his chest, and decapitate the head. That didn't happen in the Middle East. That happened right here in our country. Extremists blow up a mosque, kill 250 plus People. You know why, folks? Because where sin abounds, it's ugly. 
where sin abounds, it's filthy. Where sin abounds, it's grotesque. Where sin abounds, it's vile. Where sin abounds, it's trash. You know, it's one thing to read about it or to, 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 to read about it in a book or a, or a news article. It's something else to see it. And unfortunately, I have seen it. I saw it when I was in Chicago on the bus route up there in Bible College. I saw the man in the suit and the tie with his hands on the parking meter on State Street and and, and, and unshaven and disheveled and all dirty and vomiting, pardon me for being graphic, puking all over his tie and his suit from his drunkenness. I've seen it. I saw it in Chicago with the mother sitting there with the blood pouring out of her mouth and out of her nose after her husband in a drunken rage kicked her in the face. I saw that. I saw the man lying on Division Street and had to divert the bus. And he's lying there with blood streaming out of his head on Division Street and a broken whiskey bottle in his hand. I've seen it. I saw it in Iowa, in rural Iowa. In a town of two or three hundred, a cantaloupe and a watermelon town called Conesville, Iowa, where a twenty-something-year-old stout young man in a drunken stupor beat the life out of a little two-year-old girl with his fists. I've seen it. I've seen it in Illinois. Teaching in Bible class years and years ago, a young teenage girl who grew up to be a thirty-year-old woman who one day took a gun, killed her boyfriend, her three kids, and herself. Right over here, 40 miles away. I've seen it. I've seen that I've seen that in this building, in that little room back there between my office and the secretary's office, I have seen the numberless tears that have flowed down the cheeks of people who have been touched personally by the destructive nature of sin, either their sin or somebody else's sin that has affected them, sometimes teenagers and children who had no choice in the matter whatsoever, and their lives affected by the awfulness of sin. The filth of it. The grotesque nature of it. Sin is awful. Do you get the picture, friend? Do you see this morning where sin abounds? Sin abounds unto death. When sin abounds, the arrow never points up. Where sin abounds, the arrow always points down. And if we, if we could put sin, if you will, if we could put sin in a great big box, I mean a huge box, and imaginary, start walking through it, we would find death and we would find sorrow. We would find sadness and we would find hopelessness. And oh my, here's an abundance of immorality and, and lust. And oh no, here's an abundance of hatred and an abundance of murder and killing. And over here is an abundance of abusiveness and drunkenness and child beating and child molestation and child pornography. And here is lying and here is deceitfulness. And everywhere is this scene of destruction. There's no peace. There's no joy. There's no hope. We descend deeper and deeper into this box of sin. We find it more repulsive, more hopeless. Drug usage and adultery and homosexuality and lesbianism and transgenderism. We find the death of the biblical institution of marriage, biblical morality, biblical distinction of gender. Farther and farther we go, folks, the picture is getting darker and darker. Over here, it just gets more filthy. The love of money causing murder, causing betrayal. Deeper and deeper we go. The cursing of God. Pride abounding. The worship of Satan in the occult world. Oh, the ruin. Oh, the wretchedness. Oh, the, the landscape is, is littered with destruction. Is there anything of any value? Is there anything of any worth? Is there anything that would create any kind of hope in this hopeless place, this awful place of abounding sin? Anything? Ah, uh, but as we walk through this place of abounding sin, we notice a door in the floor. And on the door is stamped the word grace. And opening up that door to see what's behind it or beneath it, Marked grace, we follow some steps down into a bright and shining room 
where there is peace and joy and comfort and love. And in the middle of that bright and shining room, that, that there is a fountain that is overflowing with a liquid. But it's an unusual fountain. The liquid flowing from that fountain is not clear like water. And it's not, it's not, it's not the texture of water. In fact, it's a, little bit, uh, it's a little bit thicker than water. It's not water. It's blood. It's a fountain filled with blood. And friend, where sin abounds, abounds in number and abounds in disgust and abounds in slavery and abounds in filth, and abounds in illness, grace abounds more. No, excuse me, I said that wrong. Grace doesn't abound just more. Grace abounds much more. In all the trash, there's a treasure. In all the junk, there's a jewel. It's called the grace of God. I love it. I love to hear Lester Roloff sing. Somebody asked me the other day, when Roloff was alive, when he preached, did he sing before he preached? Or after? Yes. He sang before, during, and after. And if you get on the right website, this is one way you can use the internet for your good. You get on the right website, you can get those old songs by Lester Roloff. Hear him singing with that Honey Bee Quartet. And they used to sing the song, Dark the sin that soiled man's nature, Long the distance that he fell, Far removed, From hope and heaven, near to deep despair and hell. Oh, but there was a fountain opened, and the blood of God's own Son purifies the soul and reaches, here it is, deeper than the stain has gone. Oh, praise the Lord for full salvation. God still lives upon His throne. And I know the blood still reaches. You say, Pastor, in your little story about the box of sin, why didn't you have the door of grace leading out this way? Because grace goes deeper. Grace goes deeper. And this is what Paul is saying, friend. He's saying everything we lost in Adam's disobedience because of sin and all that sin is, its filth, its vileness, its disgust, its awfulness, all that sin is, all that we are because of sin can be, re- we can regain all that we lost and much more because the obedience of Jesus Christ And brother, here's what we need to see, people, as far down as anyone can go in the depths of sin, in the junk of sin, there is a jewel of grace that has the power to save a life, change a life, as far down as you can go. Whether it's the life wrecked by alcohol, whether it's the life ruined by drugs, whether it's the life perverted by immorality, or... If it's the life like the rich young ruler who did the very best he could, but he loved money. If it's that life, as deep as sin can go, grace goes deeper. What a God! You say, I've got a loved one, Pastor, involved in all kinds of perverse living. I've got a loved one involved in alcoholism or drunkenness. I've got a loved one involved in drug usage. I've got a loved one like that woman at the well in Samaria who had five husbands and was living in immorality with a sixth man. And yet when she took a drink of that living water... The grace of God went deeper than her sin. Forgave her. Cleansed her. Washed her. Made her a testimony for Christ. Tell you something, if you've got a loved one way, 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 far away, deep, deep, deep in sin this morning, I know it doesn't make you happy, it hurts your heart, but friend, always cling to the fact that in the midst of the junk, there's a jewel. In the box of trash, there's a treasure. If they could ever be introduced to the grace of God. 
The grace of God goes deeper than the stain of sin. In this great big box of sin that contains nothing worthy of keeping, full of junk, we find a jewel. And oh, what a jewel. Sin has left a deep, dark stain on the life of every person. But the grace of God goes deeper than that stain and can wash it away in the blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Adam's disobedience leads us to a great big box of junk right in the middle of it. But in that box of junk, there is a jewel of grace placed there by Christ's obedience. Now listen very carefully. Some of you in this room, you need to embrace that grace. You need to embrace it. Quit fooling yourself. Your life is wrecked by sin. Quit fooling yourself. So well, I'm not a I'm not a drunk, I'm not a drug abuser, but you're a habitual liar. Deceiver. Hey folks, you know what the Bible says? The Bible says if we offend in one point, we're guilty of all. So quit trying to measure yourself and just admit that you're flailing away in this filthy box of sin and you can't get victory in your life and it's just one thing after you've tried to turn over a new leaf and tried the seven steps to this and the 24 steps to this and tried all this and tried all that and you ran down to a church and had somebody baptize you real quick because that'll do it, you know, but you still aren't there. You know why? You've never embraced the grace. Embrace the grace. Reach out and trust the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as your only hope of heaven. That is the jewel in the midst of the junk. That's the treasure in the midst of the trash where sin abounded. Oh, thank God, grace did much more abound. Some of you need to get saved. You need to embrace it. Listen very carefully. Some of you need to engage in the grace you've already embraced. Do you know that there are saved people still living under the guilt that was associated with that old box of sin? You're still living with it. You're living with the memories of that old life. And you carry along this sense of guilt. And will I ever be good? And friend, let me tell you something. The day that you came and embrace the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, you were washed as white as snow. You were justified in the sight of God, which means it's just as if I'd never sinned. When God looks at you, He doesn't see you. When God looks at me, He doesn't see me. He sees the spotless, pure Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. God's forgotten what we used to be. Engage that, man. Quit letting the devil use that old past against you. Quit letting the devil use that old life against you. The grace of God washed you. The grace of God cleaned you. The grace of God has made you a new creature in Christ Jesus. Behold, old things are passed away. All things are become new. Man, you're a new person in Christ. Enjoy what God has done in your life. Quit carrying it. Quit carrying it. Understand you're bought with a price, friend. You've heard the old story. I won't tell it as, as elaborately as it should be told. But somebody had passed away and they were having an auction of all, an estate auction and this place was filled with things and finally the auctioneer came to this, uh, this old box and in this old box was this old violin and they kind of held it up and they said, let's try to sell this violin and there was kind of a chuckle in the crowd. And he said, who will give me a couple hundred dollars for this violin? And there were no bids. And he brought it down. How about 150 for this old violin? How about 100 And there was chuckles. And people were catcalling from the floor. Who will give me $75? Who will give me $50? Who will give me $25 for this old violin? And they were heckling him and catcalling. Get on to the next item. And finally, an older man from the back of the room uh, raised his hand and said, Sir, uh, give me a moment. He walked forward. He said, can I see that violin? He took that violin in his hand, plucked the cord, the strings a little bit, twisted the knobs at the end, took the bow out of the, out of the case, and began to play the most beautiful melody you could ever hear. Beautiful melody. Handed it back to the auctioneer. 
The room was absolutely perfectly still and quiet. He said, what do I hear for a bid? Somebody said, I'll give you $100. Over here said, give me two. Over here, three. Over here, four. Over here, five. Over here, six. You know what the lesson of the story is? What matters is whose hands the violin is in. And when you came to the Lord Jesus Christ, you might have come a broken, bowed, blinded, binded, grinded sinner. But when you got saved, brother, you became somebody in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let it go. God has. Run over here and bring back. God, I'm I'm so sorry for all that stuff I used to do. I feel. God said, "What stuff? What are you talking about? What stuff? Let it go. That's what grace does. Grace doesn't just give us more. Don't forget that little four word, four letter word. Grace gives us." Much more. Much more. Friend, in the junk, in the midst of the junk, there is a jewel. In the midst of the trash, there is a treasure. Where sin abounds, it's ugly, it's ugly, it's vile, it's wicked, it's perverse, it's dark, it's hopeless, it's restlessness. Ah, but where grace abounds, in the midst of that junk, There is the jewel of grace, and grace restores the peace and the joy and the love and the usefulness. And the rest, rest in your soul. There's a jewel in the junk. There's a treasure in the trash called the grace of God. Embrace it. If you never have, embrace it today. If you've embraced it. Engage it. I had no idea they were going to sing the song, The Blood is Still There. Still there. That's what grace does. It's still there. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. Thank you for listening this morning. Heavenly Father, I just want to pause for a moment before we give the invitation and thank you for your abounding, limitless, wonderful grace. Thank you for grace. Thank you for the jewel, the treasure of grace in the midst of all the junk and trash of sin. There's a jewel and treasure of grace. Thank you for what it does for us. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Ladies, I'm going to ask you to find the song this morning, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, that saved a wretch like me. How many would say this morning, Pastor, I'm saved. But I really need to engage the power of God's grace and quit living under guilt of what God has forgotten and forgiven. Thy grace has done much more. I really need to engage that. I've been struggling with that. Would you slip a hand up this morning? I see your hands. God bless you being honest. Amen. Amen. I see your hands. God bless you. Thank you. Take your hands down. There are many in this room, including the one doing the speaking right now. And we personally experienced the destructive nature of sin. It beat us down. It blinded us. It binded us. It grinded us. There was no hope, no peace, no joy. And then we got saved. God's forgotten it. God's forgiven it. It's past. It's over. What He's given us is much more. Engage it, folks. And and live it. Now, who's here this morning would say, Pastor, I've never embraced true salvation. I have never been saved by the grace of God. I've tried seven steps to this and 25 steps to this and all this stuff. But I've never been saved by the grace of God. Pray for me. Would you slip your hand up wherever you may be sitting? Slip it up and right back down. Anybody like that here this morning? I've not been saved, Pastor Angel. I don't know that I'm on my way to heaven when I die. Anybody like that in the room this morning? I'm not sure that I'm saved. If you're, if you're saved and you haven't followed Christ in believer's baptism, then the altar would be open for you this morning to take that first step of obedience. 
But friend, why don't you rejoice today in the fact that where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Why don't you rejoice this morning that in the junk there's a jewel. In fact, the truth of the matter is, even if you never hit what we would call the disgusting, perverse nature of sin, you are still guilty of it. And grace has forgiven you and restored you and so much more. And if you need to engage that and live victoriously, you use the altar this morning and tell God what He spoke to your heart about. He'll, he'll want to hear from you. If you're not saved, you can come and trust Christ today. Father, I thank you for the jewel of grace, the treasure of grace. And I pray, God, that you'll help us to embrace it. If there's somebody here who's not saved, may the pride be put aside. May the hesitancy be left behind. God, may they come and be saved this morning. And then, Lord, if there is somebody here who has been saved, and there were many hands, people who are struggling, struggling with the memories of the old life, how awful it was in that big box of sin, God, I pray that you'll help them to engage that power of grace that gives us a victorious, abundant life. Thank you for the jewel in the midst of the junk. Thank you for the grace of God. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Let's stand together. Ladies are beginning to play the song of Amazing Grace. The altar is open. If you're not sure that you're saved, I would invite you to come right now. Talk to one of these men standing down here in the front and just say, I'm not sure that I'm saved. Let the Lord God help you this morning. Quit trying seven steps to this and six steps to that and come and be saved. The only step you ever need to take is repent and put your faith in Jesus Christ and be forgiven. Thank God for the jewel that's in the junk, the treasure that's in the trash.